inside each one of us, there's an internal editor that does a very important job. It cleans up our ideas and our stories and our insights as we say them or write them. It keeps on feeding us the same ideas and insights and stories over and over and over again. And the reason why it does that is because we've been successful with those ideas and stories. And so our internal editor is trying to help us. It thinks it's helping us by giving us stuff that's it's proven to have worked for us. And so it thinks it's helping us. But actually, all it's doing is keeping us stuck. Welcome to Create New Futures thought-provoking conversations with leaders, experts, and interesting minds. Join us as we explore ideas and reflect on practices that you can use and apply to create and shape the future. With your host, author, and strategy consultant, Aviv Shahar. Welcome to Create New Futures, where we develop conversations with successful leaders to explore how you can create new futures for you and for your organization. This is Aviv, and today I'm speaking with Mark Levy. Mark is the founder of Levy Innovation, a position and strategy firm that helps organization and thought leaders differentiate by using what Mark calls a big, sexy idea. Mark has consulted to some of the world's most prominent companies and individuals, including CEOs of major brands. He has also consulted to a television special on the History Channel, as well as to the iconic Netflix series, Mystery Science Theater 3000. Beside his positioning work, Mark creates magic tricks and shows. One of the shows he co-created, Chamber Magic, has run 18 years in over 5,000 performances to half a million people and appears on TripAdvisor as New York City's top live show rated ahead of even the musical Hamilton. I have collaborated with Mark, and with his help, I decided to title my book, Create New Futures, and that is also the name of this show. So I'm thrilled that Mark can join me here today. Mark, it's great to have you here. Welcome. Aviv, thank you so much. And I like that by definition of your show's title, that I am a successful leader, right? You said I, I, I interview successful leaders. So am I to take that I am a successful leader? Well, did you not already know that, that in your space, you're a category of one? Right. <laughs> I never think of myself as a leader. I guess I am. Yeah. yeah, you're a thought leader in the positioning space and in how you apply your process to help people discover the unique gift in a way that uh, converges with the markets that they serve. And I'm doing all my talking for you, so. (laughs) Exactly. Well, see, I'm a differentiation expert, right? I differentiate businesses and shows and things like that. And as Aviv told everyone, I worked with Aviv, and I'm the one who told him to adopt the accent that you hear right now. Aviv was actually speaking just like someone from New York, a regular person. And I said, Aviv, you need to differentiate. And so he tried different accents on me, and the one you hear now is the one we settled on. Is that right? I I thought you were one of those people that said to me that this is America, we love different accents, and it's charming that I can talk Hebrew sometimes. That sounds like something I would say, exactly. So let's get back uh, in in order here because you are already (laughs) navigating me on a different path. But I I did want to ask, since we are recording this on the week of Thanksgiving, how are you? And what's one or two things you'd share right as, as we begin this exploration that you're grateful and thankful for that that occurred for you this year? Oh, yeah. Thank you for that very kind question. So one thing that I'm so thankful for is my my wife, Stella. So my wife, Stella, is in her late 50s. And that's actually apropos to what I'm about to say, is that for 25 years, she worked at a company like in IT, doing a bunch of important things, but she was nearing retirement. And she said, you know, there's a dream that I've always wanted. This was about four years ago. 
that she said this to me, that I've never been able to fulfill. I always wanted to be a veterinarian. So she retired from the company she worked at after being there for 25 years, and she got into vet school. And she just graduated this year from vet school, like five or six months ago. And now she works at an emergency animal clinic. After spending her entire life not doing that, she's actually, you know, helping animals now. So that's something, you know, that she would do something like that and, and you know, something so noteworthy and take such risk. And But with the reward of helping animals or so, that's just something I'm beyond grateful for. That's a beautiful story, and it's a case in point to the idea that in your mid to late 50s and into your 60s, you can create your 4.0 self. I, I say 4.0 because I, I think your 1.0 is, you know, through your early 20s, that, that's when you come into independence, and, and then you have the, the 2.0, which is you pathfinding your first career, perhaps the first 10, 15 years where you perhaps in your mid-30s able to find what it is that you're good at and, and how to uh, exercise your passion and, and your competence. And that leads you to the 3.0 self, which is where you get to often to also the, the prime earning zone of your life and where you make a difference but you sometimes want to then retire from that 3.0 career and still create a whole new journey, and I call this the 4.0 life. So how does one know then when, uh, when the time is right to kind of make a zigzag or, or make a transition? It's very uh, personal in terms of the needs and objectives and uh, financial situations and what a person wants to do and, and how they want to support the, the lifestyle. Of course, the, the millennials that are listening to our conversations will say, who cares about 4.0 life? Why won't you start the 4.0 life right when you're in your 2.0 life and, and live into your passion and your full competence right at, at, at the get-go? But that is not always possible for all people. And so... I interact with a lot of people in the corporate space, and I sometimes advise people that there is a post-corporate life, and, and this is what I call the 4.0, the, the fourth phase of your life. Uh, phase one is your upbringing. Phase two is you finding your path into adulthood and the areas that are available for you. Phase three is where you find your stride and you're able to, to create meaningful impact, but also then perhaps uh, reward yourself and, and create the financial freedom that you needed. And after you do that, if you haven't been able to exercise your passion inside the 2 and 3.0, you, you ought to give yourself the gift of 4.0, which sounds like Stella, with your help, being able to uh, give herself, which is, which is great. Beautiful. Yeah, it reminds me what you're saying reminds me of a concept that I talked about in one of my books, Accidental Genius, which was on how to solve problems through journaling, through r private writing that you do for yourself. And I called the idea in the book, the 20, I think I called it the 27th idea. And I talked about how you need to quickly cycle through lots of ideas because the idea that you really need is probably the 27th idea that you're going to come up with. But I said, the interesting thing is you don't always stop at the 27th idea. It's not always this eureka moment. Sometimes you go to idea 28 and 29 and idea 40 and idea 50. And only when you go that far, do you realize idea 27 was the right idea. And, but also you can't just jump as you so eloquently put it, where you said millennials will ask, Oh, at, at 2.0, why can't I just do 4.0? It's that sometimes, uh, um, it's the mind is not a precision instrument. And life is full of all kinds of different opportunities that take you in different directions. So you can't, with precision, always know what it is that you need, right? Yeah, okay. So let's rethread some of what you said there because th there is much to, to unpack and frame in that. First, explain, please, the concept of the, the big, sexy idea. What is a big, sexy idea? Yeah. So a big, sexy idea is your differentiator. It's a differentiating idea that you put at the fore of your business 
so that your differentiation comes through loud and clear in everything you do, like on your website, your elevator speeches, and all the stuff, the public facing stuff you're doing, so that anyone in the marketplace who sees that idea and falls in love with that idea associates you with that idea. Like you're the one who they have to go through for that idea. And by the way, just to, to piggyback on that, um, the thing about the big sexy idea or any kind of differentiation that it's got to be present everywhere throughout your business because people first, they enter your business, not where you want them to enter, but wherever they decide to enter. You know what I mean? Like someone will tell them about it. So they'll read about it in some, in some blog post, whatever it is. You can't, you can't predict where they're going to find out about your business. And, but also people's attention spans are just so short and they make snap judgments with very little deliberation. You know, we all do that. Until we know something's important, we don't deliberate about it too much. So your big sexy idea has got to be present in everything you're doing because you're now leading with one of your best ideas and you have the better chance of getting on base with someone because you're leading with a single strong idea that's associated with you. Right. So two questions to follow on, uh, on that, which is first, you talked about accidental genius revolutionizing your thinking through private writing. Uh, I want to understand what's the big sexy idea of accidental genius. And, and I want to also understand how do you help people discover the big sexy idea? So in whatever order makes sense, um, lead me into that, please. Oh, sure. So uh, the big sexy idea of accidental genius. So I first wrote it in the year 2000. And at that time, there had never been another book that taught business people how to solve their ideas through journal, uh, how to solve their business problems through journaling. It just didn't exist. It was, it was all about brainstorming. It was about all these, uh, you know, like out in the world. But this actually said, no, you can solve ideas on your own, right? You can, pardon me, you can solve problems on your own. So that was the idea of accidental uh, genius. And, but as far as the big sexy idea goes with working with other people, a very important part to differentiate is you have to first understand what the conventional stereotype ideas are in the marketplace. You know, what is the stuff that people expect someone like you in your industry to say and do and to advise them? Right. So because that's going to be in people's minds when they approach you. Now, once you know what the standard ideas are or the conventional ideas or the things, the preconceived notions they have about you and your business, now you think up all the differences, the different stories, the different ideas and so forth. And from all those differences, you then pick one of those differences or a combination of those differences where you lead with them, right? So it, it's the thing that you're going to be known for based on how you are different from the, uh, from the preconceived notion. Make sense? It, it does. Uh, can you, what would be an example of a big, sexy idea that differentiates and, and you help someone perhaps differentiate against the, the conventional ideas in their space? Sure. Well, um, one of my, uh, one of my favorite clients, as you are, V, is one of my favorite clients is Lisa McLeod. So Lisa, uh, when, when she came to me, she was a sales consultant, but she would train people on whatever kind of sales methodology that they wanted to, to learn about. And through interviewing Lisa, uh, I talked to her a whole bunch. And at one point, so first she was very, very like high minded. She, she like cared deeply about the world beyond, you know, just trying to make money or so. And like, it, it just was so apparent in our conversation, she was talking about Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, and she was just talking about freedom and things like that. And in the middle of one of her, one of our conversations, right in the middle, it was a total aside. She said, you know, what I really want to do is I want to, uh, I want to help salespeople. I want to put the nobility back into the sales profession. 
that was just an aside. She didn't stop or anything. She just then continued talking. So at the end of these sessions, I said to her, okay, Lisa, so here's what you do. You don't just train people on any one sales techniques. You teach them how to sell with noble purpose. And here's what selling with noble purpose is, you know, based on all the things she had said to me earlier, just not calling it noble purpose. Here's what noble purpose is. Here's the backstory that shows how you arrived at noble purpose. Here's the philosophy beyond it, uh, around it and so forth. And long story short, she's written Selling with Noble Purpose, Leading with Noble Purpose. She spoke, you know, like major conferences and all these places. So that would be an example of, right, makes sense, of an example of coming up with uh, uh, someone's big sexy idea. It's always based on something that they're saying. See, I look at people's businesses as if their business and I do this with major organizations, too. I look at their business as if it was a book. And I look at their book, quote unquote, and I say, what's the main idea that they're leading with here? And then I say, what are all the satellite ideas or ancillary ideas and stories around it? And then I say, what if we moved some of these ideas around? What if we took a satellite idea and made that the main idea of their business? Would their business or their book, quote unquote, be a bestseller then? Right, right. And, and your process in that involves some time, many hours of interview and dialogue and, and exploration. So explain a little more, what is that process? Why do you engage in, in that way, in what sometimes appear to be quite laborious? And, mm -hmm. and what is it that goes on in you as you listen and as you process these Uh, stories. In other words, how, how uh, do you discover, in, like in the example that you just offered, that um, noble purpose, how do you discover that big idea inside, big sexy idea inside those many stories? And why indeed do you need to listen, sometimes for many hours, to the person you're interacting with? Well, so inside each one of us, there's an internal editor that does a very important job. It cleans up our ideas and our stories and our insights as we say them or write them. And the, you know, it keeps on feeding us the same ideas and insights and stories over and over and over again. And the reason why it does that is because we've been successful with those ideas and stories. And so our internal editor is trying to help us. It thinks it's helping us by giving us stuff that's it's proven to have worked for us. You know, we got promotions, we sold these products, all kinds of stuff. So it keeps on giving us stuff that's already worked. And so it thinks it's helping us. But actually, All it's doing is keeping us stuck. That's why everyone listening to this, and I'm sure you have even myself, that's why sometimes we sit down to solve a business problem and we think we're so smart, but then we keep on coming up with the same conclusions over and over again. We keep on, and it like distorts our self-image. We say, wait a minute, I thought I was so smart. Why do I keep thinking the same stuff over and over again? It's because your internal editor is doing that. So what it is, is I try to ask people lots of different questions and to ask them to tell me stories about all kinds of things that they're not used to talking about. So essentially, um, it's letting the water run until the rusty water stops. And now the purer water, which is deeper, comes out. I'm not trying to be like all psychoan psychoanalytical or profound here. I don't mean anything like that. But it was more like the top of the mind stuff is what's keeping you stuck. The top of the mind stuff is what's commoditized. The top of the mind stuff I can read on your website or on all your competitors' websites. Like that's the stuff that everyone has already deemed safe by the marketplace. So we can't use that. So yeah. like it's hard to jump right away to interesting, edgy, unusual stuff. So I usually have to take people on a very kind of zigzagging route in order to get them to kind of lose sight of their normal answers and come up with new answers. Yeah, make, makes complete sense. My metaphor actually would be to that process, not so much about... Uh, Uh, getting through the rusty water, that makes a, a very good sense and image. I would offer a parallel metaphor or story, which is uh, 
you are applying a, a bit of the Marie Curie process, which is mixing a lot of pitch blend before you discover the radio. So right. uh, I don't know if you want to view yourself as such, but th that's what I think you're trying to help people do, discover the radium inside the pitch blend of their work and of their life. Right. Well put. Well put. I love that. But yeah, they, I mean, the whole idea is, is if they knew what it is that they should be saying or differentiating, they would never have called me. So I, yeah. just, I just assume like the answers that are easily at hand are not working for you. We need to go past those. And by the way, so, so the, I think you'll find this cool. By the way, so when I'm trying to get past their normal, so I let them talk about whatever it is they want to talk about. And they can talk about their ordinary stuff. They don't have to come up with innovative things right off. But I will ask them questions that seem like it's all about the ordinary stuff, but it kind of, it's so ordinary that it shocks them. Like for instance, I'll say to someone, I'll say, so tell me about your business. And they'll say, oh, what do you want to know about my business? And I'll say, I don't know. Just tell me everything that's obvious about the business. You know, just tell me obvious things, things that are like so tritely obvious, like of course. And so they'll start talking. And often when people start talking about what's obvious, it actually relaxes them. And so they start, I've had many a person come to an epiphany by talking about what's obvious because they let down the need to be so smart because that was not my question. My question wasn't tell me genius things about your, about you and about your business that no one in the world knows. Although that, that's a fine question. There's nothing wrong with it. But I didn't start there. It was more, no, no, just tell me obvious stuff. So that's always, as a matter of fact, whenever I'm stuck on a problem, when I'm trying to solve a problem, asking myself what's obvious is one of the very first things that I do. And if that doesn't work, then I take the opposite route and I usually ask myself what's surprising yeah. about what it is. And by the way, if that doesn't work, and everything, when I say working and not working, all this stuff contributes to the solution. But a very common next step after obvious and surprising, I ask myself, um, what stories do you know about this? Yeah, so, so let me ask you in there, inside this process, what is the place and the significance of discovering the, the backstory or the origin story insight? How do you integrate that? And why is that often part of that same process for you? Sure. Well, so first, let's define our terms. So to me, a backstory is the story that shows that you or your organization was born to do what it is it does. Or even if you weren't born to do it, it doing it has come to mean so much to you that you would do it almost as a cause. It's almost as, uh, you know, without making money, it's so important to you. Um, I like to use the metaphor that a backstory shows that you were an apple tree growing apples that you were doing exactly what you were put on earth to do. So what it is you're doing is probably amazing. So if you were in nature and you saw an apple tree growing apples, you would think, oh my God, I want one of those apples. They're very, I'm sure they're delicious. They're sweet. It's, it's you know, like how iconic it's doing what it's there to do. But so many businesses come across as an apple tree growing oranges, That is, it's doing whatever is expedient right now. And today it's growing oranges and tomorrow it's going kumquats and the next day it'll grow like beef and bean burritos or something. Like it's not doing anything that it should be doing. So it's probably not great at any of those things. And so your backstory shows that you're doing exactly what you were put on earth to do. So that's so would you say, so, so would, you, would you say part of what you do with individuals is you, you help them find the true voice or find congruency or authenticity in their work? Do you use these terms? To, or how would you restate what I just said? Yeah, I would say um, often, it's all those things. It's authenticity, it's congruity, it's all those things. And it, it's really, it's because people want to, again, the public, they want to know that what you're doing is appropriate for who you are. And I, so they want to know a lot about you. I'll give you another, uh, uh, I kind of think of all my principles by names, um, that it helps me to remember them better. So I actually call that idea, this is less about backstory, but just to, to go with this, I call it the open kitchen concept of business, because I'm in the old days, 
when restaurateurs were building kitchen, uh, building restaurants, where would they put the kitchen? In the back, in the corner, in the dark. And so you'd sit there and you'd say, where's our meal? Where's our waiter? I wonder if this place is clean. And it would be aggravating. So now, though, many enlightened restaurateurs, when they build new restaurants, where do they put the kitchen? They put in the middle of the restaurant or even up front, and they don't have walls around it unless they're glass walls or something like that. And that's because people care deeply about they want to see the chef's face. They want to see the waitstaff interacting. They want to see what the ingredients are. They want to see how people prepare their dishes. I even know of a very upscale restaurant in the UK. It's been open about three or four years. It's two stories tall. The bottom story is entirely the kitchen. And the second story is entirely a mezzanine where the diners sit and they can look down into the kitchen. So you spend all this money to get in and you wait on long lines to get in. And it's meal preparation is spectacle. It's because you want to see your meal and other people's meals being prepared. But it all has to do with this authenticity. The backstory is the same thing. Like that's part of the meal preparation of your business. They want to know who you are. They want to know what your philosophy is. They want to, right? They want you to be very upfront about that stuff. And Backstory helps accomplish that. When you go through this process, and what, as I said, can sometimes be quite a laborious process, what part of this do you enjoy the most? When do you enjoy your work most? Oh, yeah. Um, So the first thing is, I cannot do my work unless I like my client. So I'm very, very choosy about clients who I pick because I'm going to be very involved with them, you know, in interviews in a very close way for quite a while. So the reason why I say that is I almost always like all my sessions, all my calls with my clients, because invariably I like them as human beings. I think that they're cool people and they're doing something meaningful in the world. So I like that there. But also what I'm doing is, is, um, and I don't do this on every call, uh, but I I tell people up front that I'm going to do this. I'd say, we're going to work to create a big, sexy idea for you and your business. And so as you're speaking, I'm either going to verbalize this or it's just going to happen in my mind. Almost everything you say, I'm going to think. How could we make that into a much larger idea than it is? You know, everything that they say. So the whole, the whole time I'm thinking, okay, if that was the main idea, what would their business be? And then they, they'll say something else. I'll say, okay, if that was the main idea, what should their business be? And so forth. So, that, um, so what that does, Aviv, is it keeps me extremely active in the conversation. It doesn't mean I'm speaking all the time. I might just be listening. But I'm always very actively engaged in how do we make what it is they're saying in each and every part of the conversation into something big. It doesn't mean that everything could be big, but that's the game I'm playing. Yes. So you said that you only engage with people that you like and the people that you work with, you find a way to to look at their work in terms of they're doing something meaningful, something that makes this world a better place. What what are their core beliefs or ideas do you have in your cosmology, in your map of meaning about people that guides you and inspires you in the work you do? Yeah, well, um, I'm thinking of of a, um, a therapist who died years ago. I think his name was Saul Gordon. And Gordon said something like, uh, don't think of life as having meaning. Think of life as giving you opportunity. Mm -hmm. So it's not meaning, it's opportunity. So in other words, you're creating everything that's out there. So when I'm speaking to people, sometimes they feel stymied by just looking into their backgrounds. And the things that they've done are the only things that they think that they could ever do. You know, and even if they're not overt about that, that's kind of, you know, part of who they are. You know, they tell me, oh yeah, this is the way I do things and blah, blah, blah. You know, and if if that stuff's really important to them, we'll go with it. 
but I also kind of talk to them about the idea of opportunity and growth. That like you can be things or you can you can use philosophies or so that are important to you, but you haven't really let see the light of day yet. Does that make sense? So in other words, when people come to me, I don't see them as this as this fixed quality. I don't I don't see them as, you know, like like a a 16 ounce uh, bottle of soda. I think of them as, you know, like a hundred ounce bottle of soda, even though they think they're 16 ounces, they're really a hundred ounces. There's like so much more there that they could be. And so that's a very important guiding principle. It's like, yes. how do we make what you've been as cool as possible? But if we were to grow you in a new way, based on what you've been, what would that bigger way be? Yes, to use my language and <laughs> the language of Create New Futures, you, you engage with every person as a portal of possibilities. They, they are a cosmology of many opportunities. Most of those opportunities often would be uh, hidden and not expressed, and you're there to help facilitate the, the unleashing of that potential. Right, beautifully said. I'm just going to pay, play that part of the recording next time I have a client on. <laughs> Very yeah. good. I'll say, Mark, yeah. what did your accent change? Yeah. Let me take you back to the beginning of your, your journey, and let's start at the beginning. Describe to me, if you can, your earliest formative memory. W- what happened in that situation, and how did it impact you? I just want to listen to how you describe an, an early formative memory. An early... Well, see, I thought about my uh, about my early life. It depends. Are, are you talking about my earliest memory or just a memory from childhood? A formative memory, something that something that shaped in some way when you looked back at it. Oh, yeah, that this and that happened, and I can see why that became meaningful for me and why I remember it. Oh, yeah, totally. So this is something I've talked about uh, before, though I haven't talked about it in, in a while. Um, I remember that when I was, I was eight years old, this was 1971, I suddenly loved baseball. Like I went to bed at night, not liking baseball. And then I woke up one day, like a light switch went off and I like baseball. I don't, I don't have, I have no idea how that happened. And I lived in Flushing, Queens, New York, which of course is the home of the New York Mets. And so my favorite team was the New York Mets, and my favorite player was the Mets' first baseman, Ed Cranepool. I idolized him. I wanted to be a first baseman like my hero, Ed Cranepool. And so my dad bought me a first baseman's mitt, and I practiced playing first base. And whenever we play pickup games in the neighborhood, all the ki- other kids knew, stay away from first base. That's Levy's position. He's going to be <laughs> first base, right? Because I, right, that's all I thought about, right? And so, though, in order to be a major league first baseman, I knew that I would have to up my game. And so upping my game as an eight-year-old meant joining the Little League. So I went to Levitt's Field in Flushing, and that's where they were having tryouts for the Little League. And I remember I was there with like 25 other kids or so, and there was an adult there, Mr. Jacobs. And Mr. Jacobs said, all right, kids, right? This was at the baseball field. He said, I want you all to run out onto the field, all of you at once, and I want you to run to the position that you most want to play. And I ran over to first base, and I guess I wasn't too swift with probability because I didn't realize there were four other kids who were already standing there at first base. So my dream of being a first baseman was also their dream of being a first baseman. And I was absolutely crestfallen because even though I had never met any of these kids before, my eight-year-old mind, I instantly knew how they were superior to me. This kid looked stronger than I was, so he could hit the ball further. This kid looked more wiry than I am, so he could probably feel better and so forth. Never saw him play, but I knew they were better. And I just was miserable. And Mr. Jacob said, okay, wherever there are multiple kids standing at a position, we're going to have to have a tryout. The only problem is that all you kids ran out to eight positions on the baseball field, but a baseball field has nine positions. There's a catcher and none of you ran to catcher. We cannot play the game of baseball without a catcher who will be the catcher. And almost without thinking, I just tossed my first baseman's mitt aside and I ran over to the catcher's position and I picked up the catcher's mitt. And Mr. Jacob said, okay, Levy's going to be our catcher. 
And if you end the story at that point, it is a story of my cowardice. Because I had a dream of being a first baseman, I saw that there were people standing in my way, and I didn't want to test my dream out in the world and show that I was lacking. So it was a total, like, stick your head in the sand moment, except that the story does not end there. Because now that I was the team's catcher, I was their only catcher, I was going to have to catch every inning and every pitch. So I had to get good really fast. So what I did is I went to the library and I took out a book on catching and read it. And also when I started to watch the Met games now, instead of focusing so intently on Ed Cranepool at first base, I focused on their catchers, Jerry Grody and Duffy Dyer, and like what they did, like where they'd throw their mask during a pop-up so they wouldn't trip on it, how they'd throw out base runners and so forth. And I started to incorporating these things I noticed from the book and from their play in my game. And I got to be so good that three months later, when the season was over, I actually represented our little league team in the all-star game as catcher. So where you end the story is very, very important. If you end it early, I'm a coward. If you end it three months later, I'm an all-star. And the point I want to make with this about formative for me in my business is all on my own. I had discovered the principal idea that has to do with all positioning because all positioning, it's predicated on this idea. It's, it's, there's a field, it's either a baseball field or the field that you are in listener, listening to this, whatever your field is, your business field, whatever it is. And so there's a field and in the field, there's all kinds of positions and some of them are very, very crowded but some of them are open or have less competition. So you want to pick the position that you can win just by stepping into it. Mm -hmm. Just by stepping into it, you are the winner. And I discovered that all by myself with no coaching. And it's really the strategy that I use with all my clients, whether they're an enormous corporation, like multi-billion dollar corporation, or an individual. It's, you know, what's the open position here that's going to best represent you and get you what you want so you don't have to fight so much? Yeah, and, and one can say that, you would probably say that the work you do today is, you are a catcher today. You're, you're catching people's uh, ideas, big, sexy ideas, those ideas they couldn't find themselves. But, but uh, let me ask, how did you discover that technology or process technology or, or central idea of, of the old positioning. How did you, what led you to that epiphany that shaped so much the work uh, you have then uh, led with, with many people over the last number of years? Sure. Um, again, it goes back to something I said earlier in this conversation, where I look at people's businesses as if they were a book. So when I was a kid, I majored in writing. I have a degree in writing. My first job still while I was in college and even after school was in bookstores. I ran the information desk and I knew every book. I was just great at it. And then from bookstores, I went to publishing houses and I went to book wholesalers. So I had to sell books on the phone and I ended up, I was there for like 14 years. I ended up selling, helping to sell over a billion dollars worth of books. Now, the interesting thing, you have to sell a lot of books to sell a billion dollars. They're very cheap, especially at that time. And so books, if you think about it, in a way are a commodity. Like the Stephen King novel that I have is the exact same Stephen King novel that my competition has. And it's the same Stephen King novel that the bookstores already have. You know, like it's the same thing. So it's the ultimate in commodity. So how do I go around about helping to sell over a billion dollars worth of books. I had to be able to look at a book and size up whether it should or shouldn't sell very quickly, including considering factors that fell fell outside the realm of the book itself. Like, for instance, if it was getting close to Christmas and the book was an art book and it was being printed in China, and like it would have to go through customs, it would have to go on a boat and whatnot. Like maybe it wouldn't be back in time for Christmas sales for the bookstores. So I would, for instance, I'd call a bookstore and I'd say, "Hey, I only have fifteen thousand copies of Animalia left. Do you want any?" And all the bookstores would say, "What are you kidding me? I already have hundreds and hundreds. I don't need any more." But then when I'd say, "Oh yeah, it's printed in China." It's coming. And by the way, I don't remember Animalia. That was a real book at the time. I don't remember where it was printed. But, you know, it's printed in China. 
and it has to go through customs and blah, blah, blah. And it's not supposed to be back in America until like December 29th. So do you need any now before Christmas? And where they would say no, now they'd say, oh my God, give me 500. You know what I mean? Like you'd go, so, uh, uh, so I had to be very, very swift at sizing up a book, whether it should sell or not. And then what are all the factors around whether it should sell or not? And then I had to get on the phone and sell them to people. So I did that job for 14 years and I was great at it, but I foresaw, I was essentially a middleman. And so I foresaw middlemen going away that, you know, manufacturers or publishers and the bookstore, they would interact more directly, that they didn't need me as much. So that's when I left that business and I started my own business, which I called a positioning firm. This was 17 years ago. And it was essentially, again, just looking at your life, whether you frame it for me that way or not, I just think, okay, you know, you listener, the person hearing this, if you were to talk to me in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, what's the main idea that this person, what's their book about? Even if it's your business or so, right? I'm using book metaphor. What is the idea about And then I'd want you to continue to talk to me about your life and your goals and what your business can do and what your competitors do and all these things. And I'm saying, and stories about it. And then saying, okay, is the book that this person leading with, is this the best book they could have written? Or can you use one of these lesser ideas and make it bigger to make a bigger seller? What did you do for Netflix and the Mystery Science Theater 3000? What was that about? And what was your part in the... In that endeavor. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, for Mystery Science Theater 3000, uh, uh, so uh, I worked with them. I can. Cons- I uh, worked with Joel. Joel is the brilliant, unbelievable creator of that show, and uh, I just worked with him during uh, re- uh, reboot. We had certain, uh, you know, like discussions, and then later on, I even wrote for them. So that's what I did for, uh, I, I didn't work with Netflix directly. It was, you know, Joel and MST3K. I worked with and, what was the, and what was the collaboration with Steve Cohen on Chamber Magic like? What was that experience like for you? Oh, yeah. Well, right. So Chamber Magic, that's the show that uh, in the very beginning, when you were saying who I was uh, kindly, some of my background, that's the show that on TripAdvisor is the highest rated live show, at least as I'm saying this, higher rated than even Hamilton. And so what Steve was, Steve was a performer. He was a magician. But at that point, even though he was a brilliant performer, he was undifferentiated. You know, he tried to differentiate himself by calling himself a conjurer, you know, and back then this was pre Harry Potter. People had no idea what that was, so they were confused. And back then, there was uh, the internet was not a big thing. So you really had to see Steve perform with your own eyes. Otherwise, you wouldn't even know how good he was. So things it, it, was, it was difficult for him to get across his talent by just saying he was a magician. And so what I did was in working with him, I saw first that like he was brilliant. You know, he went to Cornell and he grew up near a very affluent part of Westchester uh, uh, in New York City. And so very early on, even when he was first learning magic, he learned how to perform for a very demanding crowd. And that was the filthy rich, right? Even as a kid. So it was almost like Darwinian. It was almost through evolution that Steve had to get very, very entertaining and very technically proficient very fast because these people who had all these resources that they could spend wherever they want, they wouldn't tolerate anything than the best. So Steve got good really fast. The thing was, he was not a business person. So he didn't see this and he wasn't exploiting it. So I watched him perform a dozen times and I interviewed Steve and I interviewed his audiences or so. And I said, Steve, this is a place that no one else is claiming. Like all these other magicians, they do interesting stuff. You know, David Blaine's the street magician and so forth. They're all doing interesting things. But no one is a, is a magician for the filthy rich. And so we changed all his branding. We flew in his clothing from England, his morning coats or whatnot. We changed his entire show around the concept of the millionaire's magician and so forth. It was just taking talent and skill he already had. You know, I mean, that he just wasn't, you know, like talking about and moving it to the fore. And I said, I said, 
in order to be the millionaire's magician, you can't take the $2,000 gigs. Because if someone comes to you and wants you to do a $2,000 gig, that's going to prohibit you from getting $20,000 for the hour long gig. So you can't do that. And at first it was very difficult for him, you know, to turn that stuff down. But eventually, you know, he did. And now he performs, he's performed for Warren Buffett, you know, um, you know, the queen of Morocco, Stephen Sondheim, Woody Allen, you know, just, you know, legion, just five, over 500,000 people. There's even, his show is Chamber Magic, which I helped him co- uh, co-create. There's even a Chamber Magic day in New York City by proclamation of the mayor. And this was all just from positioning, man. It was just from, okay, what's great about you that you're not seeing? And if we moved it to the four, what's your brand become then? And then he ran with it. Yes. So with all that you have experienced and with all that you know and all the people that you have taken through your process, if you were to lose all of a sudden all that you know and keep only one or two ideas or one or two capabilities or skills or one or two practices, what would you keep for yourself? Oh, interesting. I've never looked at it that way. Um, but that's the magic of Aviv. It's, let's see, what would I keep? I don't want to repeat myself, which is why I'm hesitating. I could instantly have blurted out. I always say that the, the most valuable thing that I know is, is that if you could solve the problem, we wouldn't be speaking. So we need to get you off your normal ideas and insights and stories. Mm -hmm. Like, Like in other words, we need to diverge from what's normal. That's always been my, like people kind of ask me, by the way, they'll say, oh, are you, do you have any pre-work to give me? And I haven't given, maybe I will in the future, but I haven't given pre-work in, in virtually my entire life. And that's because when I first started out, I would send people questionnaires and things to fill out. And what they would send back to me would be so deadly boring that I just couldn't stand to read it because it was so tedious because it was, it was all the stuff that was keeping them stuck. You know what I mean? It was just commoditized stuff. It was, you know, like just awful. And so I'm aware of, you know, again, the idea of having to let the faucet run in order to get to interesting ideas. Um, So that would be one thing. Uh, Another thing is you said, what's an idea or two? And that is what it is that you need to bring to the marketplace. See, so often people, they do a lot of surveys. Let me put it this way. When someone comes to me, let's say they want to write a book, and I say, what kind of a book do you want to write? They will, and by the way, you can apply this to your business too, but I'll I'll talk about books. So I say, what kind of book do you want to write? They instantly tell me all about the marketplace. They say, here's who my market is. Here's what my market's interested in. Here's what my marketplace has already read. Here's what I think I can sell the marketplace. And I stop them because having people to buy your product, having a marketplace is super important. But if you start there, if you do it too early, to me, you're going to come up with something miserable and unhelpful. And that's because the marketplace, two reasons, the marketplace cares rightfully about their own goals. So that's cool. They should do that. But your goals and their goals may not coincide so closely. So if you start with their goals, it might lead you astray from what it is you should be doing. And the second thing is the marketplace is only going to tell you what the marketplace already knows about. So everything that you're saying, oh yeah, here's what they like. Well, yeah, all that stuff is pre-chewed by other people. That's the safe stuff. The edges have been removed. So now you're going to come out with something that just sounds like what everyone else is doing. And so is that really what you want to be doing with your life? You know, Person and, or an and, artist, and so you want to be like everyone else. So we'll get to other people. We'll get to the marketplace. I'm not saying that we won't, but the first place you need to look to is to yourself. It's like, what do you want to make happen in the world? What do you want to make happen? In right. We start there, and only after we're clear about that, then we look at the market. Beautiful. Thank you, um, thank you Mark. Uh, this was a, a rich exploration with you today is as we bring this to landing what parting wisdom do you want to offer to people listening to create new futures 
wow, you ask these great questions. Usually I just go, boop, I just blurt things out or whatnot. But with you, I have to think. Uh, I would say that uh, sometimes... Apart, apart, from, apart from, by the way, apart from the most important word in every sentence is the last word of that sentence. Right, exactly. <laughs> one, one of the laws of Mark. Yes. Right. <laughs> When I worked with Aviv, he actually made an entire list of laws of Mark, and that was one of the things. I remember that. I forgot about that until you just said it right now, the laws of Mark. Um, I would say that in order, um, um, in order to do something special, uh, you may have to grow to do something special because fear may come up. Something that you didn't expect, you might be scared of it. But the fear may not mean that you should ignore what it is you need to do. The fear might be pointing you into the exact direction that you may be doing something so important for yourself that that's why you're fearful. So don't always look at the fear in doing new things as meaning I should stop. It also could be a, a, a pointer saying this is exactly what I should be doing. So some fears, some fears you must lean into to discover the potential in them, but then there are those fears that you should not necessarily uh, lean into. How do you differentiate between these two? You hire Aviv and he'll coach you into delineating which fears you should lean into. And I think you. that's the right answer there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you so much, Aviv. And by the way, just before we go, I don't know if you still do this, but everyone listening, right? I've had many conversations with Aviv boys the, over the years, and he would always begin every conversation with what? What phrase, Aviv? Well, you typically ask me, how are you? And I say, life is a gift. Right. So to me, that's far more. And if you know Aviv, if you knew Aviv personally, that is the most sincere, heartfelt piece of wisdom that you could get because he really lives that way. So anyway, let's take my stupid fear comment and put it off to the side and let's leave in a rousing way on Aviv's life is a gift comment. Here we are. We've landed this Create New Futures journey and it's your time to take action, to create your new future. Here are a few steps you can take this week. First, dare to cycle through many ideas. To get to the 17th, the 27th, and even to the 37th idea. To then find the one that's right for you. As Mark says, the mind is not a precision instrument. Find ways to bypass the internal editor that narrows your range of options and forever leads you to the same conclusion. Get the rusty water out so that the pure water can come through. To differentiate, you must first understand the conventional ideas and then discover the big idea to lead your work, the one you will be known for. Second, to find edgy, unusual ideas, learn to diverge from what's normal, from your standard routines. To free yourself up, ask yourself first what is obvious. Discover then the epiphany latent inside the obvious. Then ask what is surprising. Use these questions to spark novel ideas and to expand your range of possibilities so you can find the radium inside the pitch plant. And third, discover your origin story. Where and in what can you be the apple tree growing apples? As Mark pointed, There are many apple tree people trying to grow oranges because it is expedient or in fashion. What is it you do that's like apple tree growing apples? People want to know and feel that you are doing what you were put on this earth to do. And when you do, your presence and your work will encourage others to find the work they are meant to be doing. One more thing. You can reach me directly by phone and on email to explore how we can help you and your team create new futures. See you next time. Thank you for listening. Aviv always encourages his clients to identify 
the one or two ideas they can move forward into action immediately. What will you capture and apply today? You can always begin with a small action and then build momentum over time. When you move forward from an idea to action, you get immediate ROI, return on the time you invested, and return of learning. And then the learning cycle builds the success propulsion. One more thing. You can reach Aviv directly by phone and email to discover how he can help you create a new future for your business and organization. Creating your new future can begin today.